It's time for Declare Your Independence with Ernest Hancock. Believe me when I say we have a difficult time ahead of us. But if we are to be prepared for it, we must first shed our fear of it. I stand here without fear because I remember. I remember that I am here not because of the path that lies before me, but because of the path that lies behind me. I remember that for 100 years we have fought these machines. And after a century of war, I remember that which matters most. We are still here! Tonight, let us make them remember we are not afraid! Be afraid, but that doesn't keep you from uh, spending some time in the Hooskow. Well, our guest, Dean Pleasant, did and was very infamous for it. Now, I, I want to get right to him because he's done the research on this and things that we need to know. And what we need to know is what the future is based on what the past has been and where we're trending. We knew what to look for in legislation here in Arizona. And, uh, you know, here it came. You know, we, we, we got a dose. So I want to take this hour, and we're going to have Dean explain this kind of stuff to us, and you're going to want to share this. Dean, help me out, man. Let me go ahead and hit your mic. I need to understand how it is that we are in the situation that we are, that somehow the state became part of the federal government. How did that happen? Well, essentially, governments were were case. We got a bad mic. Get the other mic. Yeah, that's what we're going to do. We're going to go ahead and fix this and see if we can get in. Yeah, he was on the wrong mic the whole time. Go ahead and try it. Okay, that now one. I'm going to have to sit in a totally different spot because I can't even reach it. Well, the answer is to your question that, uh, as is usually the case, the states were bribed with federal money. You know, they were put on the government teat, they got used to the money. Later on, the conditions and terms were renegotiated, as almost always happens when you take federal money. And we have the situation we have now where the states do not have as much autonomy of their defense forces as they once had. Okay. What money? Well, there there had to have been some kind of uh, deal struck sometime for some reason. Why? Yeah, that was in 1903, a piece of legislation called the Dick Act which was uh, named for a congressman named Dick. And uh, you have to understand that ever since the Civil War, the cause of empire was becoming more alluring to those in Washington. But if you want to have an empire, you have to have an army of empire. And the system we had for defending our borders, for defending our lands uh, up until the Civil War and even for quite a while afterwards, just was not amenable to that. We did not have a a military that was capable of going gallivanting uh, overseas, at least not on par with some of the other colonial powers that were looking to divide up the world at the time. So uh, military officers who had experienced having to command and deal with state guards and state militias uh, during the Civil War, uh, during the uh, Spanish-American War in which Teddy Roosevelt became famous, uh, they determined, listen, this just isn't going to work. You know, if if we're going to have... Uh, if we're going to achieve the goals that we see America needing to achieve on the international scene, we need a world-class army, and the militia just was not amenable to that. Uh, so they already had the uh, United States and its wealth targeted for, we're going to rule everybody. Teddy Roosevelt himself called colonialism the great game. And that was his focus during his time in the presidency. He wanted America to become a world power. And it was during his administration that many of the key uh, initial conversions from state commanding their militias to the federal government commanding the militias or the state guards or what we now call the National Guard took place. You know, uh, in 1903 was the Dick Act. Uh, Just two years later, they amended it. You know, one of the key things they had to do in order to get the states to swallow this, they said, okay, states, we're going to give you money that we previously have not been giving you so that your state guards can be better equipped better standardized so that when they do have to work with a federal uh, standing army that they can do so in a better fashion, a more effective fashion. And the state said, oh yeah, free money's good. We like free money. 
but the states, you know, they were hesitant because they said, well, what are, we, what are you going to do? Are you going to take our state guard units and send them overseas? We don't want that. Uh, so, Of course not. No. We would never do that. Well, what the, they reached a compromise in the initial 1903 legislation. They said, well, for only up to nine months may the president command the state guard of any state to go overseas or do something like this. Primarily, we want the state guard to repel invasion. We want them to put down insurrections and, when necessary, to enforce laws. That's really all we want to enhance their capabilities to do. And that whole overseas adventurism thing, well, you know, may come up occasionally, but it's not going to be a big deal. That was what the, that was the lie they told initially. And it's then always they, the promise. And they immediately began to change it in the preceding years that followed. Okay. What was the first change? The first change in, let's see, 1908, they deleted the nine months overseas service clause. <laughs> <laughs> of course. And, and then we got and World they War left I. it open ended, you know, and, and this was primarily due to Teddy Roosevelt himself. Remember, he was a president at this time. He was the one who was talking about how we needed to project power in our sphere. Well, the Rough Riders, I mean, what made him so, you know, our great war president and famous and bully, you know, was him. Um, charging up San Juan Hill, was it Cuba or Puerto Rico? Where was that? It's uh, it, Cuba, right? Uh, yeah, I believe so. It was Cuba. Anyway, the point is San Juan Hill, wherever the heck that is. You know, I'm I apologize. And I it don't was know. his militia unit that did it. Right now, see, that's my point. He was already, in the, and I'm wondering how the heck did we get involved in doing that to begin with? Wasn't that, the, remember the main thing, a Spanish deal or what? Well, you know, the whole controversy over the main, you could do shows upon shows uh, regarding they, that. You know, you know, false flag kind of thing. Yeah. But, but, you know, this, I mean, it's the same, same, same. So here we have someone running for president. That man, he was tailor-made for the big bad boys that wanted to have the capacity pro to project the will of whomever using the military force and the wealth of the American people. That, I mean, you, you can't, you could not, we were set up to not have that happen. In fact, even after the Civil War, they did the posse comitatus thing. They did not want the standing army federal kind of thing again. And the posse comitatus, a lot of people misunderstand how that is that it came about after the Civil War. Uh, many of these state guards, you know, uh, that were in the southern states, uh, they were commanded by federal officers, but they were still local boys. And many of them... Uh, you know, they didn't like the fact that blacks had newfound, new established rights. And it was not uncommon for the state guard units to, during an election, go out to the polls, supposedly for the purpose of keeping order. But what they were essentially doing was they were electioneering if they weren't just outright turning people away. And the Posse Comitatus Act was passed to prevent that sort of thing from happening. It was electioneering by armed bands. Uh, okay. So now we get to the Dick Act, federalizing the state what? How did they define it? Did every state have their own governor's guard kind of thing? I mean, it, it explain to me what it was that they were taking control of. Well, the history of that goes way back to before the time we were a country. It's been traditional that uh, communities of any kind, but states specifically, have had some sort of self-defense protective force. And we call these the militias. And prior to the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, each state was essentially its own country. You know, many of our founders at the time would refer to their state not as a state. They would refer to it as their country. And uh, again, we could get into all the history about how originally we were a confederation and you know, whether that was better than or worse than what we now have under federalism, but uh, this was carried over. So each state had its own protective force for various applications, self-defense, obviously, but also to put down riots, you know, rebellions, things like this. And uh, most of the founding fathers wanted to keep that because they remembered well how the standing army under the British had been brutal and suppressed them and uh, violated what they felt were their rights as Englishmen. So they, the last thing they wanted is a standing army. And we did not really have a standing army until the revolution, and it was later codified in the Constitution. And, that and even was then the it was only, even then it was only to be funded every two years or something. Yeah, and the states had to fund their own particular groups. Uh, you know, they uh, they did it at their whim. There, there was great social standing in being in the militia. You weren't really considered a man unless you were in the militia. Okay, in defense of what? Yeah, that freedom thing. We'll talk about more when we come back on Declare Your Independence in just a little bit.